everyone, and welcome to Sped Homeschool Conversations. We are so happy to have you here with us again tonight for our weekly conversation about special education and just how homeschooling parents can um, can do the best with you know what they have, but also learn from experts. And um, we have definitely an expert with us tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about enhancing language for all children with autism with Dr. Marion Blank, and we're so happy to have you back again. Um, Marion, because I think the last time everybody said, yay, we're so glad to have her and we're so glad she's coming back already. So um, so last time we talked about um, reading comprehension and tonight we're going to talk about language as we um, were talking this whole month about different ways to help children communicate better. And I think we're, we're going to cover a broader subject um, of of language and what that means and, and all of that. But um, if you don't know Dr. Mary Blank, she's a world renowned literacy and language expert who developed and served as a co-director of Columbia University's development, um, developmental neuropsychiatry program for autism and related disorders. And she also has two online reading programs, ASD reading. Um, oh, I had those on the last broadcast set up and we had this switch. So um, ASD reading is asdreading.com and also Reading Kingdom, which you can find at readingkingdom.com and also author of books. And um, you shared some some really great articles with us last time that we, we have up on our website now for parents to to access. So, so lots of really good information. Most of it goes over my head. So <laughs> Um, but we're, we're so glad to have you back. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule as you're traveling and, and taking some time out to, to talk to us tonight. So thank Hi. you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And I also want to thank Bookshark for sponsoring this episode and we'll hear more about them about halfway through this, this broadcast. But as we get started, um, our topic being language and helping children, uh, with autism, to increase language. What specifically should parents understand what language is? It's, uh, that's a great question. Um, and actually, when we've posed it to anyone, even very sophisticated researchers and so on, no one can come up with an answer. Really? Uh, okay. Because language is, language is amazingly complex and people just don't know where to begin to talk mm. about it. One of the first things that is very helpful, I think, to parents and to anyone working with the children is that we should really separate language and communication. Mm. Very often they're together. Uh, many, yeah. they're just put together and they, they're they sort of, and then people say, well, communication is just language in use, but it's very different. Mm. It's uh, years ago, I uh, wrote a case study up uh, that received a fair amount of attention. It was called Language Without Communication. And it was a child who was huh. similar. He wasn't autistic, but he was sort of on the spectrum. Okay. And he was um, of able. He was very quiet, never spoke. He was really electively mute most of the time. The only mm -hmm. time that his mother was so concerned about him. So what she did was set up a series of routines um, which made him comfortable, very set routines, going to pretend going to get gas with okay. all the devices, you know, the the, the mm -hmm. gas station and so on. And another was making a certain food and so on. Uh, by the way, it's very, if for pa parents who are interested, it's in some ways it's similar to uh, the new film called Life Animated by a, hmm. by a very well-known writer who got his son to talk, his autistic son, to talk through uh, using Disney movies that the, that the yes, I on. interviewed another gentleman that whose son did the exact exact same thing. So when you give a very restricted field, it allows the children to um, develop the language. Uh, mm. And what was interesting, so this child, it was like you pushed a button when he'd see the gas station, he would start with the routines. And if you saw him talking uh -huh. with his mother, it didn't look very unusual. But as mm -hmm. soon as the material was gone, he never spoke, didn't speak to his mother, didn't speak to anyone. Mm. We, we eventually got very, we were very successful and we got him to function quite well. But uh, the thing is he had language 
and language really is a mm. system with it's oversimplifying but it has three major components it's got okay. the it's got the sound structure and that's if we're talking about spoken language if it's sign mm -hmm. language it'll have the signs but right. the, the sounds of a language are very different from the sounds in the world for example mm. a car noise or a uh, a brick falling or any those are different sounds but the sounds of right. language are very specific things they're called phonemes and they um require a, a, a complicated system of processing and the second mm. aspect of language is semantics which are the words we speak uh yeah. so if i say papa or if i say biba those are phonemes but if i say mommy that's a word and, right. and and then the third major component is syntax, which is the grammar of the language. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three components. Now, communication is using those skills and also nonverbal skills, such as smiling oh, and yes. mm -hmm. gesturing and uh, using unusual body postures. Oh, you know, like this facial mm -hmm. expression. You can use both nonverbal and verbal means to communicate. And so right. what, what I am finding and what a lot of people are now finding is that children on the spectrum can do amazing things in language, which people never expected. All the books that are being written uh, mm. by um, individuals who are autistic and very still very autistic, but uh, they write with beautiful prose. Um, mm. So they have language and they also in writing have communication, um, right. but they are, their body language, their motor skills and so on, prevent them from using spoken language or from using so, it well. Uh, so uh, people, we're, we're in the process, I think, of radically changing our views on the language of children with autism. Uh, because what, the, and there are probably good reasons why literacy is much easier for them than spoken language. Uh, but literacy has been a totally undervalued skill in working mm. with autism, largely because the assumption was children must speak before they learn to read. Since so right. many of the children didn't speak, they said, well, we can't possibly teach it them just, reading. Right. But you actually can. And what we do in ASD mm. Read is we've taught many children who don't speak how to read and write. Now, and then they can get a full language system. Now, some of them mm. will then use that to begin to do sp use spoken language. Not always, because there are motor problems in some of the children that prevent oh. them from speaking, mm -hmm. even when they know language and want to speak, but they can't. Understood. Yeah. yeah. It's 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 kind of backwards of how we would normally think about it. That's right, and mm -hmm. we're not too good about being novel in our thinking. <laughs> exactly, we're, we're very. <laughs> We've always done it this way. It should be done this way. Exactly. And, and exactly. Yeah, that that is very very difficult to to kind of take a step back and say we need to look at this very differently. Yeah. And and not prejudge that language just won't exist if it doesn't follow these preset patterns. Exactly. That we see in typical children. Exactly. So, yeah. So um, the, the other thing we we had um, added to the title was enhancing um, right. language. And I'm assuming enhancing means more than just teaching them to talk better. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. It, it means the, the broader perspective of what you were just talking about. Right. Now, it, there have been a huge number of programs to teach language to children with autism. The, mm. dom the dominant model has been what's called ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis. Yes. And that's the one that gets funded. That's the one that mm. claims great mm -hmm. success. In fact, their teaching of language is very restricted. And mm. um, often, uh, actually works against the child rather than helps the child, hmm. uh, which is a hard thing to, to believe because these are very well-intentioned people who are trying their best. But right. um, 
but they're really so i'll give you some examples yeah that'd be uh, great yeah what the easiest thing to to get a child with autism to say if you're teaching spoken language is our nouns so there are endless what is this questions what is that questions and right. uh there is a huge amount of effort on naming object size shape color number you know what what color is this what uh what, show me the big one that kind of thing right descriptors that's right but the thing is that nouns are only a very small aspect of language uh, right. for example to have a real understanding of language the key thing in the start of language you must have a verb system yes and the ABA does not do well with teaching a verb system. And then it was interesting. We had one parent who gave us quite a big donation to develop AS, a, a different part of ASD reading because mm -hmm. of one thing I said to him. And he said, uh, I said to him, does your daughter know the past tense? And he said, no, she had been through four or five years of ABA training. And I mm -hmm. said, has, has she ever been taught the past tense? He said, no. And I said, if you don't know the past tense, there's no way you could possibly read with meaning because practically everything that's written is about the past tense. Exactly. And so that just illustrates a huge gap that has existed in the teaching of language in most mm -hmm. programs for children with autism because people don't think in terms of syntax. And if you think in terms of syntax, you realize that we have a noun verb system and the verb system in our language is what conveys time, future yes. and mm -hmm. present and past. And it gives you a tremendous entry into the world of the non-present, which is mm -hmm. what you want when you're talking about language. And so in not teaching this, we've, they've neglected a huge area that mm. is vital to effective language use and to understand yeah. other people. So that, for example, um, if someone's talking about, which you readily do, if you're sort of saying, oh, uh, Joey went to the store because we didn't have any milk and there's no Joey there and you don't understand how they could be talking about the non-present, the language just seems insane. It's, it's like nonsense. Right. Yes. So in order, so you have to know what you want to teach. Now, another mm -hmm. aspect of language that's very important is the form. Now, the most common form, and they start practically from day one, is to ask children questions. That's why, they, yeah, what is this? Discussion before. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. And what is your name? Mm -hmm. uh, where do you live? You know, that kind of thing. And in fact, questions are one of the most, they're emotionally challenging, like the word interrogation. Exactly. They're, they're constantly being questioned. And mm -hmm. the children do not know what to say. So the typical thing that you see in classes with children with autism is that they name things no matter what's being asked. So if they say, what is the boy doing? They say, boy. You say, no, 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 no. What is the boy doing? As if they didn't hear you and they'll say blue because he's got a blue shirt on so they're giving you the categories that they've been taught to talk in right. names and colors so when i was analyzing this i said they don't know what to say to different questions so one what i did was develop a system and it's in a um, manual we have on asd reading called unlocking language uh we haven't put that in software form for a variety of reasons, but it's a very comprehensive manual that teaches the sequence of how to teach the sequence of language. So for example, what I decided was that the way to help the children learn would be to show them the way the words implicitly that are carried down should be made explicit so the child knows what to say. For example, if you're saying, what is the boy doing? The answer is going to be the boy is sitting. So you're carrying down the the and the boy and the is and the ing. Right. They're putting it in context. Instead That's right. Of just the single one word answer. That's, That's right. Not related to anything else. Absolutely. Yeah. And then so and if you ask uh, to the question, which one is a boy? The answer will be this one is a boy and they have to be other 
figures around that are not boys and so on. So when I realized that, I said, but they have to be speaking in sentences. So before we even teach questions, we teach children how to say sentences. And one of the things, and I'll say to parents, and they, when I first meet them, they'll look at me as if I'm out of my mind. I'll say, we have to get your child up to imitating eight to 10 word sentences before he can answer a question because he has to hold that much information in mind in order, he's got to hold the question and the answer in mind to answer the question. So the kid, mm -hmm. the child has to be up to eight to 10 words. So we'll do it by, we, we'll do it by teaching him sentences like, here is a boy, the, they have to just imitate. The boy mm -hmm. is standing, mm -hmm. uh, here, is a, here is a dog, he is not standing and so And then we'll eventually get to things like, here is a dog and there is a cat and so on. Once, we're get, once we get the child smoothly imitating the production of sentences, then we can start question asking. So it's, ah. it's built into the intervention before we even raise questions. And in the right. meantime, I say to parents, don't ask questions. And they look at me and they say, well, then he won't think. And I said, first of all, questions <laughs> don't make you think, they frighten you. And I said, <laughs> and I said, and I said, how, yeah, I've spoken, it was really interesting. I spoke, I remember years ago, I spoke to a woman whose child was totally nonverbal. And she must, I, she asked him hundreds of questions every day. And I said to her, because it's, that's what you do when you have a non-speaking person or a non-speaking organ. That's why people question their dogs, but they actually get a response from their dog. They'll say, would you like to go out, Rover? They don't, right. they do it all the, when you have a non-speaking organism, you want to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I said, has she ever answered one question? And she said, no. I said, why don't you stop? And she couldn't stop. It's, it's. It was ingrained in their, that, their relationship at that exactly, point. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And one, and very often when I'll start with parents, I'll say, do not ask questions. And they say, well, so what can I do? I said, just comment, just say something like, oh, you look so comfortable there. Uh, it's such a nice pillow or whatever. Just simple sentences, slow mm -hmm. and not flooding the child with language. Many of the parents say within two to three weeks, they're amazed that the language production of the children increases. Wow. And that's yeah. because you well, take the anxiety goes down. Exactly. Sure. exactly. And the child begins to listen more because he's not under pressure. And as he listens, he begins to speak more. Oh. So um, it's 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 very what we I think what we need to do is very different than what is usually done, mm -hmm. and that makes sense because we know that the success of teaching children with autism has tended to be very low, right. and uh, the the costs are astronomical, but the methods that are accepted as the right way to go are almost certainly not the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I forgot when we got started, um, you can ask questions. <laughs> now that we're talking about questions, um, right. our audience, I'm so sorry, our original video that I had programmed and set up a week ago didn't work. So we had to create a new one, but I'm glad we have viewers right now. And if you want to be part of this conversation and ask questions to, to Dr. Mary Blank, um, we would love to have those as part of our conversation as well. Um, thank you for finding us and, um, and, and for watching. So, um, and for those of you watching via the podcast or our, our recorded videos. Um, thank you for, for doing that as well. So, um, so we've talked a lot about, you know, language development and just how atypical it is. What are some, you know, and I guess we've already kind of covered some of those pitfalls that parents fall into yeah. um, that. Are, are there any others as far as um, differences that necessitate different teaching methods? Uh, a huge number. I don't know if we can cover them all. Okay. But <laughs> one the of the, ones? <laughs> yeah, I, one <laughs> of the top ones is, uh, and I wrote an article about this many years, several years ago in the Huffington Post, mm -hmm. is the use of teaching children I want. There is, a belief, there is a belief that if children will say what they want and you give it to them, you're going to encourage language development hmm. because they'll see that language pays. I have never, ever found that to be the case. And I can give you reasons why, but I will in a moment. 
But what I said was basically when you're doing that, you're setting up a contract with the child that if he says what he wants, he will get it. And then what happens, especially as the children get older, they start asking for things that you can't possibly give them. Oh, uh, and yes. what happens when they you don't meet their request, they have violent temper tantrums. Hmm. And, they, and now they're big, they're 14 or 15 years of age, they start hitting people, they start ripping pillows apart, they start banging the walls, and they're in a sense right, because you're breaking your contract. You said, if you say what you want, you're gonna get it. Hmm. And it, it, it's so deep in people. I, re, I There's a family I'm working with now, and um, the, the child doesn't speak, he can do, he reads and writes, and so we communicate with him that way. Mm -hmm. He can understand spoken language though. And uh, he often is resistant. He was allowed to be resistant mm -hmm. for six years of training. And so I, it's taken us some time to help change that. But he was very uh, sullen one day and wouldn't work. So they said to him, why won't you work? And he says, I don't like to. And oh. so the father said, but he said, it's, he wrote it so nicely. Why don't you give him what he wants? And the father couldn't, under, it would be totally counterproductive to give the child what he was requesting, because then all we'll have to do is say every day, I don't want to work. And you're going to get, let him get away with it. And it, it, it's, uh, so there is this belief that if the child speaks nicely and makes his request nicely, it should be honored. What I teach parents to do mm -hmm and this really upsets them at first, I said, you <laughs> never give a child what he wants when he requests it. You give yeah. it to him at other times when he's in a good mood, when he's pleasant, when he's cooperative, when you know he likes it and it's a nice thing to do, but never as part of a contract of you say it and so you get it. And right. we do that with typical kids. Exactly. And it's, so it, it's all about relationship. Exactly. It's not about the things and it's not about getting a result. It's right. about communication and right. about understanding each other. Right. So the, uh, but it has been, and now, for example, there is a huge industry in the field of autism, which involves augmentative devices because mm -hmm. children don't speak. And so the, uh, the children get a device invariably. I've seen these devices used very effectively, for example, with children or individuals with cerebral palsy, because they want very much to communicate. They can't use their voice. Yes, and they and, can't use their voice. And yeah. the device is great. And so they write all kinds of things or make put together ideas that are, all, that are really interesting and useful and relevant and so on. Personally, I have never seen the device used with autistic children hmm. um, for other than I want. In hmm. other words, the child has to point or cre create a symbol or trigger a symbol or whatever of the thing he wants. And he's got to put together a sentence like, I want Apple, whether it's with symbols or pictures or whatever. Hmm. And so I have never seen the augmentative devices used for anything other than I want. And I think that's a, a huge error that is uh, causing enormous problems for the children and for their families. Yeah, we, we did a couple interviews earlier this month on how to do testing of mm. children of different spelling words using AAC devices. It was actually very fascinating, um, but in not using it in the context of I want. Yeah, oh, I've true. seen, yeah. But, yeah, um, but we do have a question from a viewer on this okay. as well. So sure. I'd like to put that up. She says, I'm doing the ASD language book with my boys. Yes. My son who is functionally nonverbal has some language, has a lot of trouble with two part directions. He's been struggling for years. What do you recommend and how do we proceed with AAC with your book in, um, instead of focusing on verbal production is, is what she Well, the, the thing, it's, it'd be very hard unless they have some of the very advanced AAC devices to use um, unlocking language in, with, with a, a device. We use it very effectively when the children learn to read and write. In other words, if yeah. instead of, if you want, uh, for example, if you're a stage where he's imitating and he's, you have a little figure of a 
a cat and you say the cat is resting or something, mm -hmm. um, he can write it. You, you say, write, the cat is resting and he can write it. So you can do, I do less when I do it with writing because it's so much more time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do everything in the Unlocking Language book when the children have written language. It would be extremely hard to, with most augmentative devices, to use the really well-constructed grammar and sentence structure and so on that we're using in, AS, in Unlocking Language. So in other words, you can do it without speaking, but you can't do it without written language. Right, because you've got all those connecting words. And exactly. Usually AAC devices focus on the, the main verb, the main exactly. noun, exactly. and not, not the full syntax. Exactly, the, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I'll t I, you know, this, I, I don't know if I've mentioned this one when I was on last mm -hmm. time, because this is something that has been very important in my work, and I found it to be fascinating. Hmm. Uh, and and what it is, is that if you look at, at, at normal language development in children, which was a very big enterprise a number of years ago, it's, it's less focused on now. Hmm. What they found is when children entered the second stage of language development, which is still very, they have still very little, 12 to 18 months of age. Oh, wow. They go from the production of one and two words like more juice or which you know they're at right. that say oh go bye bye you know now they're at three and four words um they spent and they're as i said somewhere between one and two years of age they spend mm -hmm. six to eight months learning 12 words and those words are non-content words these little words in other words the child spends months figuring out what is means what the means what ing means, it's quite amazing. And why do they do it? And the reason they do it is because when you're, if you've ever been in a foreign country and someone speaks to you, you can't, you, you can't break that stream apart. It's almost impossible. And that's, right. what, a, that's mm -hmm. what a little child faces. And so what happens is the, ch the children who are, have good language skills and who have uh, no problems, you know, in the language realm, will say, hey, I got to crack that code. I got to figure out what those people are saying. And what they do is they say, oh my goodness, there are only 12 words, I keep hearing them. I keep hearing a the. As soon as the child hears a the, he knows a noun is coming. When he hears an is, he knows a verb is coming. Right. And what, he, what these 12 non-content words do is it allows the children to, to grasp the key categories of language. So they spend months doing it and they crack the code. And I decided to use that in teaching reading because these words, which are not taught much because in reading, these are called sight words because you can't sound them out. Right. So they get no attention. What I've done in my reading program, both in ASD reading and in the reading kingdom is make these non-content words, they're called non-content words, or sometimes they're called functors. And sometimes they're hmm. called the little words, but the point, you know, the words I'm talking about. Right, exactly. And I've made them a central part of the teaching because hmm. they actually are the majority of words that anyone ever reads or anyone ever speaks. They're, so the, they're the majority of words on a page and they are absolutely hmm. critical for children with autism. What's interesting hmm. is the kids really dislike these words, these children with autism. They, largely, I think, because they know they're difficult because what I'll do when we're in imitation, I'll say to the child something like, well, here is a boy. They say, boy. I say, no, here is a boy. And I know the child can produce four words. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, no, here is a boy. They say, boy. I say, no, here is a boy. They'll say, that is a boy. No. They'll say, this is a boy. They'll say anything but what you want. But, but, they, have, <laughs> but they have to know a lot of language to be able to do that. So they are very resistant to these words. But once you get help mm -hmm. them master them, it tremendously accelerates their language development. So parents can use this in, because uh, if a child is cooperative and getting behavioral control is very important. I have a book yes. on this called Spectacular Bond on mm -hmm. how do you get behavioral control. But once, if a child is cooperative and he's at the table, let's say eating, you can say, um, uh, we are eating and have him say that. or 
or mm -hmm. uh, uh, this soup is really nice. And they can say that. So that getting the children to use these words is absolutely critical. Plus, it becomes mm -hmm. very important for other people to understand them. So, for example, if a child comes into a room and says, doll, 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 the person says, oh, what, you like the doll? You have a doll? This is like your doll? They don't know what it... But if a child okay. comes in and says, I have a doll like that, you know what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So you, they need these words for their communication to be understood by anyone other than their parents. The parents usually understand it. But right. if they're they interpreted all their lives, that's right. But if yeah. you're talking to what you're doing is you're giving the children a system for being able to speak with pe other people so that other people understand them and don't keep saying, What do you mean? Uh, what are you trying to say? You know, right. And then it just gets frustrating and right. the child gives up because exactly. they don't understand me. And this is my the way I've been taught to communicate. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the nice thing, uh, the the good news is you can do so much. We can do much more than people ever thought. Mm -hmm. But it's very different from the major paradigms that are out there that people are being told to use. Right. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, and then we'll be back to um, to talk some more to Dr. Marion. So get your questions ready, and um, and. We'll have her back in just a moment here, but I'm going to bring up our sponsor, which is Bookshark, and we want to thank them for sponsoring quite a few of our episodes, and I just want to read to you a little bit about their program. They are a literature-based, four-day, um, faith-neutral um, homeschool program, and Kim McNeary, um, a busy homeschool mom, says this about them. She says, my daughter is on the spectrum as well as has OCD and is instantly taken to this curriculum. It's incredibly structured, um, which makes us both ecstatic. The books are great, and the kids are awesome. I'm running my daughter to all kinds of appointments, and this curriculum fits in amazingly. We are the first-year Bookshark customers and happy as a lark. Kim is right. Bookshark is a fully planned four-day homeschool curriculum that flexes to match your busy lifestyle. Um, it has a instructor's guide laid out so clearly that all you have to do is open it in mere minutes you can start um, curriculum for ages 4 to 16 is available in all subjects packed individually or as a full curriculum set so um, definitely check them out at bookshark.com and um, thank you bookshark for sponsoring again this this episode and we're going to bring um, marion back and um and continue this conversation. And like I said, bring your questions. We would would love to um, to know what you have to say. And and also, I want to put up your it's um, the one curriculum we've been talking about with um, with um, Marion here is ASD reading, and that's at you can find it at asdreading.com. And but also you have Reading Kingdom, which is for typical learners or um, kids that don't need the full um, program for the, the ASD reading program. Right. So, and both of those are on our website as well, but you got asdreading.com and readingkingdom.com. So and and cool. both of them have a number of, of uh, manuals and programs aside from the reading program itself. Uh, it, it'll be in the stores that they have. Right. Like the, like the unlocking language program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are great resources, especially if you're like me and didn't even know what phonics was before you started homeschooling. <laughs> I was a little green on that side. Yeah. I have a degree in physics. I could teach math and science till the cows came home, but not reading. Yeah. <laughs> so we appreciate all of the experts and what they've written and um, I'm definitely some some good stuff out there that we're hoping that you'll find on our website and from these interviews. So, um, so in speaking with parents, um, what are some? I guess we've been talking, you know, practical things as far as you know, just not asking asking questions and using full sentences. Um, are there any other things that you tell parents to, to either stop doing or? <laughs> start doing that um, that they just would normally mimic as um, trying to create language in the household or are there there are things that we bring into our household even um, or that 
that do help or hinder. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, reading out loud and mm -hmm. movies and I mean, do those help at all or? Um... It's, it, 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 those are good questions. And the answer is we don't know because mm. um, there was some studies done a number of years ago which showed that the children when they were asleep, the children with autism when they were asleep had different brain reactions to language than if, really? they, they played they played particular segments to them. And their hmm. brains, while they were totally, you know, not aware of it, was res right. was responding differently. And obviously, that's almost true. certainly, their brains treat language differently. Hmm. Uh, and that's why they prefer written language uh, to spoken language, because I think right. in part, see the spoken language signal is very, very complicated, very fast, and mm. very variable. Uh, whereas written language is stable and solid and doesn't move. It only you you control. <laughs> and that is and that's and these children are very good with visual stable images. That's what, many of them line up blocks, for example, line up cards. Mm -hmm. They're very yep. good in the non-moving visual world. And mm -hmm. so written language is a really good way uh, to uh, reach them. And what the interesting thing is, and people don't believe me when, when they come and, and we talk, I have yet to find a child, a non-speaking child with autism who did not have some written language in his mind before he ever saw me. And uh, mm -hmm. I've demonstrated that to parents over and over again. The children sort of, they are seeking meaning and so they and they find that the written language realm gives them this in a much better way than the spoken language. Huh. But one of the things uh, on a very different note, which I think is really important, is and in years ago I was trained. I had a, I was trained by a person who was very interested in Russian psychology, and in Russian psychology, <laughs> the concept of inhibition. This goes back to Pavlov and so on and Luria and Russia. It, the concept of inhibition is very important. And we almost never hear about it in the United States. They, they talk about inhibitory patterns in the brain, but you are, you are, you're constantly talking about activation, stimulation, getting the child stimulated and so on. Mm -hmm. But my, when I speak to the parents, my first uh, goal almost always is to get the child to inhibit all kinds of acting out behaviors. Mm. Because until they do that, they cannot pay attention to the stimuli that they need to pay attention to. And right. so that is very hard. It, well, it's hard psychologically for parents to do because they find, they they feel that it goes against being loving and warm. Mm. So, and, and I, as I say, parents who are interested, they can find out or the, the program I've developed uh, it's called Spectacular Bond. It's available on Amazon. And uh, it's in a book. And uh, we train the children. And until the children, it only, if you do it well, it only takes about two to three months to do it. And you've got a, a really totally different child by that time. And once you have a child quiet and attentive, not for all day, which would be ridiculous, uh, right. but for short segments, 10 minutes, five minutes, 20 minutes you know, once you have a child attentive then you can start teaching them all kinds of things so mm -hmm. before you start and i i have two new clients recently who have 14 year olds who are totally out of control mm -hmm. and it's very sad to see these huge they're big now one of them is over six foot, foot tall and they've been through every major program that has been offered in the field mm -hmm and none of them have been successful. And the reason they haven't been successful is because none of them got the children, got those boys to get behavioral control. And it's a very neglected uh, domain. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and it's vital. And uh, unless you get it, the teaching is almost always a waste. Because, right, because yeah, you're not you're not getting through. Exactly. Uh, and we tell that to parents too. It's it, you have to develop that relationship, and and children on the autism 
spectrum, especially I've noticed they love boundaries. They yes. love those closed sets. And if you don't set very, very secure places for them to be, they, they will react out because they feel insecure. Exactly. And you're, you're exactly. not being mean at all. Yeah. And then there's another area that has not been sufficiently studied. For example, one of the areas is memory. If you do not have memory for sequences, you can't learn language mm. because language is memory for sequences. You can't right. you have to put it in the right order. <laughs> that's right. And you've got to remember that the third word is different from the first word. You know what I mean? It's, it's, right. you've got to remember what these words are and the order. Order is very important uh, in yeah. English. For example, if you say the boy kissed the girl, it's very different from the girl kissed the boy. Uh, order makes a huge difference. And so what we do, and, and this is in the Unlocking Language program, is before we teach written, uh, spoken language, before we teach any actual language, we develop a whole range of pre-verbal cognitive skills in sequencing, in memory and attention, which lay the groundwork for better language acquisition. And right. so parents are very anxious to get language as fast as possible. And I, it's very important to say, no, hold off. You've got to put in the prerequisites in a careful way or it's not going to succeed. And uh, people have not been giving sufficient attention to the perceptual motor prerequisites that language needs for language to develop. Yeah, I, I, I remember even hearing about, you know, just reading and, and how the cross lateral body movements and yes. you know, all of these things that we don't talk about. We rush children into these reading programs and and then we just expect the reading program is going to handle all of these other right. connections in the brain and all these other things that that we just expect to miraculously be there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I mean, it I I think I hope the field will keep growing. I mean, I think one of the, uh, we're, we're increasingly seeing the skills that these kids are capable of, which people thought they were totally incapable of. Mm. But we really have to develop better intervention programs to capitalize on it, to develop these skills. And uh, those are not that commonly available, unfortunately. Right. The other thing that, is very, which is really important, I think, um, is that the parents need not do all the work. It's very hard to raise a child with autism, but they have to do a good part of the work. I've had parents come to me and say, I want the professionals to do the hard work. I don't want the child to associate me with demanding uh, activities. I want them to just feel love for me. And I want, the, I want to hand over the work to professionals. And I'll say, I can totally understand what you're saying, but it's not going to work. If the child doesn't sense that the parent is on board and does some of the work, it's never going to succeed. And exactly. um, so that is uh, a very important component. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing that happen more with this new generation coming in. They're just, you know, before I could say, this is a curriculum you can use. And they're yes. saying, no, who can teach my child? Yes, exactly. And and it's like, no, it's you. You have to teach your child. Yes. yes. And certainly, and I've, uh, what I've done with many parents is that if, if they can afford outside help or family help, and so, try and balance it with other people. But they must right. do a, they must show they're on board and that mm -hmm. they agree with it and they, that they do part of it. And mm -hmm. if they don't, it's not going to work. Right. Well, you almost have to be even duplicating at home what is happening with the tutor. Just exactly. because you can't expect one hour to work in teaching your child when this is something that's conversational. It's part of their life. It's it's something that needs to be backed up on a consistent basis. Absolutely. So, yes. Absolutely. That. And, you know, that relationship, you don't want to give that away. I know my son uh, that was diagnosed on the spectrum is now 22. And I, I love that relationship I have with him, mm. you know, and I, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it was a difficult relationship <laughs> most yeah. of the time. Yeah. So, 
What, well, let me ask you a question since you've read. Sure. What did you find was the absolute, what were some of the key things that made things better for you or the things that made things worse? Well, for my son's language, he loved to listen to audiobooks. Oh. And loved the conversation, you know, especially the audio dramas. Um, that really helped his language development mm. and really kept him engaged in wanting to learn to read because he saw the value in in books as having something more than just the laborious task. He didn't learn to read till he was 10, but he the set, next year after he learned to read, he was reading at college level oh, yeah. because his his language had been spurred yeah. by all of all of these people talking, you know, it, it was just he just couldn't get the the combinations. So um, but it sounds like I, I did things right, even though I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting that you found that the, uh, the the those scripts paid off. But as 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 mm -hmm. we mentioned before, it, that really is a very good medium for the children. Yeah, we did a lot of read out louds too. And yeah. you had talked about the at the table, you know, when they're eating. Yeah. They, they're occupied and they give you more attention. I often would miss a meal to to read out loud to my kids um, mm. because I felt that them hearing books in context was very important. Yeah, yeah. But that's a, a great activity for so many. And unfortunately, given the pressure of life today, it's being done less and less by parents and it's yeah. it's it's a very it's a very unfortunate uh, development because there's one of the it's practically one of the best activities you can do with children mm -hmm. it's they, they love it it's relaxed uh, and you you can have a really expansion of your relationship through it it's and, yes. and develop mm -hmm. language at the same time yeah you, you share stories which have become life experiences you know mm -hmm. I, I think I was talking about how just w when I asked my kids questions, even about those books, yeah. it wasn't just the, the questions about what, you know, what color was this? You know, what, what you were talking about is how did that person feel or mm -hmm. how, you know, getting into the emotional part, mm -hmm. what do you think they, they felt when this happened to them? Um, mm -hmm. So you can start, start building in these people have feelings. It, yeah. We are just reading about, you know, somebody that that just we did a lot of historical fiction too, so, mm -hmm. so that helped. But yeah. Well, we have one other question from our viewer. She says, Is the ability to do the cognitive exercises in the ASD language book necessary for a nonverbal child to learn to read and write? That's an interesting question. I don't know if it's necessary because we'd have to do a lot of studies to find out. Certainly mm -hmm. some of them are necessary, uh, but I just think that the that they lay such a good foundation that, and they don't take that much time. It's just, uh, there's no harm in doing it and a, a lot of potential gain. Uh, the activities are set up for 15 or 20 minutes and you can get most of them done uh, within a few weeks. Now, some of them are really important. For example, if the child is going to write, whether it's going to be handwriting, which is harder, or the child's going to keyboard, or even, you know, use a uh, key scre a screen, uh, they've got to have the motor skills to make this go quick, reasonably. And so you've got to develop, I think it's essential to develop some of the precursor perceptual motor skills before reading. So for, and, and then you've got a very, you have to watch carefully what the children are doing. For example, a lot of the children, if you give them a keyboard, love to just move their finger back and forth on the keys until they find, they make it into a game. Mm -hmm. um, but that means by the time they type a word, it might be 20 seconds when it should have been one second or two seconds. And that slows up the whole reading process and it distorts it. So you want the development of smooth, fine motor skills is one of the most valuable things you can give to a child. And unfortunately, we're losing them today for a number of reasons, one of which, well, first of all, children with autism have almost always have fine motor problems. So they start with a handicap. But uh, children who are neurotypical are using devices so much 
And that means just yeah. a few finger movements uh, and they're really not developing the fine motor skills that they used to have, that children used to have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very unfortunate development because I think fine motor functioning is a very intricate, important brain skill. Right, yeah. So well, yeah, we're, we're, in a, we're in a very dramatically different age than we were and no one, no one quite knows where this is all gonna take us. Yeah, I, I learned very quickly that you don't teach typing to a child who likes games with oh. a, a, a a game that teaches typing because all yeah. he wanted to do was win it. Yeah, exactly. You don't win typing, yeah, <laughs> you sure. master it. I know. So I got the old fashioned book from the library and bought one that they were taking off the shelves and thought that's what we're using. Yeah. <laughs> And, and it works so well. <laughs> it does, but it's very hard to get parents today to do anything that isn't a game. And they've been taught that there was a lot of research going on uh, from academics talking about gamification and that every that we that children would learn with gamification. Well, the studies have shown they don't learn with gamification. They'll well, look at the things are like shoot and get the right answer. They're mm -hmm. not about the learning process. Exactly. And so what you do in the initial work is you get the what they call eye gazing. You know, the children look at it, you get visual, but they don't learn anything. And uh, gamification has been, uh, but it's a powerful force. Mm -hmm. And parents go along with the children saying, I want it to be fun. I want it to be fun. And basically what happens is the children get bored within two to three weeks. They don't learn anything. And then you've got to give them another game and you're, you're still a square one. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah. There's it's learning is hard and um, <laughs> we can't, you can't skirt around that. Um, but you can need to learn that some things in life are hard, but they're worth yes. working for. Well, I, but the thing is once you start the child on the road to mastery, you really get them going along with you, particularly when they're young children like nothing better than mastery. Yeah. So once they see, in other words, if you're willing to tackle the initial, yes, the child may resist a bit. And particularly in our society, which doesn't value diligence and diligence is a great skill. But mm -hmm. once the child sees that he's mastering, you've got tremendous motivation going. And one of the things I found with the, the children with autism, what happens is what I work very slowly because they're they're insecure and they are full of anxiety. And mm -hmm. so we, so for example, in Reading Kingdom, we, if a child knows a word, we'll skip it. Hmm. Because a t neurotypical kids who know something, they say, why am I doing it again? Whereas right. in ASD reading, I've kept them in even the words they know because the children are comforted by the repetition. Yes. So, mm -hmm. but, and, but as they get better, they're willing to make the leaps. So yeah. you've got to be much more, I guess, slower and systematic with children mm -hmm. with autism, but the payoff from that is enormous. And uh, so when, when, I'll for, when I'm working with a child directly, when I start introducing new material, they get nervous. Mm -hmm. and, but, but within a few months, once I'm introducing, and I never make dramatic changes if I can avoid it. Um, once I start introducing something new, you see them sort of gird themselves, but they're ready. And then they get better and better. So aiming, mastery is just a fabulous skill and we, we don't value it enough. But if you ask like any tennis player or, or, a, or any musician, they have had to do tremendous amounts of repetition to get to the skills that they are. Right. Yeah. But we don't do that in teaching regular education, which no, is we just move them right along once they they get one thing and you, yeah. you don't go back and circle around and right. make sure that they still have it. Yeah. Um, and it's becoming less. I know we, a lot of people I talk to in the, the public schools, mastery is not even something that's on their radar almost anymore. They that's just right. kids by with like 20% retention and yeah. say, you, you'll do good on the next grade level when they haven't mastered it. And I often will tell parents, stay on that until that child has what they need um, to 
to master that. And yeah. oftentimes that means sticking with the curriculum way longer than the curriculum was developed for. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, it would be, you know, I hope, I really hope we can develop some levels of diligence. I know, for example, at least it used to be the case, Japanese children, uh, diligence is, you know, just a given that they're going to have to do it, you know, right. whereas in the States, yeah. uh, we've taken a very different uh, approach. Mm -hmm. so. Yep, make it fun. Yeah, make it fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to put up your... Um, Again, it's it's ASD reading is the the one curriculum that um, Dr. Marion Blank has developed, as well as Reading Kingdom. So ASD reading you can find at asdreading.com, and um, then also Reading Kingdom be, can be found at readingkingdom.com, or you can find them on our website as well, and links to those. But um, as we're wrapping up, is there anything you want to? summarize with our parents as far as enhancing language for their children with autism? Well, I think we've covered it. I think, I think pro the re probably if there's a single takeaway, it's to ask many, many, many fewer questions that you actually make the child much more relaxed, much more involved, much more attentive mm -hmm. by, but learn, and it's a very, it's an inter it takes parents, if you've got a ch very verbal child, you don't have to think about it because the child is giving you constant feedback. And so you right. adjust to what he or she is saying. Like you'll mm -hmm. say, uh, well, I think we're going to, uh, I don't know, go to the uh, market now. And the child says, well, you know, are we going to get such and such there? And then you say, no, no. So the conversation just rolls along. Right. And so one of the things parents can do it's sort of fun if they'll do if if there are several people working on it together. Is I, I tell parents sit in front of a mirror, and just well, it doesn't even have to be a mirror. It, it helps, mm -hmm. a little, but and just comment. So, but comment in an interesting way. Sort of say, I never realized that TV was that big. It's much bigger. You know, it's so much bigger than the first TV we bought. You know, whatever twenty years ago, or mm -hmm. just kind of, or. Uh, I wonder if I could get another pillow like that. Um, it's so pretty and I should have bought one when I was in the store. You know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. learning to comment about everyday life as if it's sort of nice, you know? And right. so you've got to get into that pattern. And once you are, then you can chat in a way that makes the child more comfortable and gives them better models. Yes, so, it's um, modeling. And yeah. you, you've got, if you don't want them just answering in one words, as you're expecting with the questions, you have to be speaking in full sentences. Right. And it's one of the, well, this doesn't happen too much with children with autism because they have language problems, but with uh, ch children with language problems who are milder language problems, parents will always say, what did you do in school today? And I say, if there's one question you eliminate, it's that one, because the kids <laughs> don't know what you're asking about. They don't know what they're supposed to be talking about. The school day was this long, complicated thing, and they right. dread that. So I say to parents, just instead comment about your day. Sort of say, it was raining so hard today, but mm -hmm. I was I was able to drive to where I needed to go. And, and if you do right. that, the children begin to comment back to you within a <laughs> few weeks. Because, so we, our society tremendously overuses questions. And they and then they just don't pay off. So that would if, if there's a single takeaway that has some value, I think that would be one of the best. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's that's something that I definitely learned tonight. And I want to thank you for for sharing that. Um, I know it's, sometimes it's hard to hear that we've been doing things wrong, but there is a way to correct it and and make it better and and just move forward don't don't look back and say man i just messed my child up no you just learned something new and now you can move forward with that and right so um so thank you so much marion we, we have appreciated you being on our broadcast twice now uh, we've learned so much from you and um it seems like our parents have got your books. We've got some of your articles on our website and um, you're just a wealth of information and such a blessing to the people that have children um, who struggle to read and especially um, children on the autism spectrum that struggle to communicate and, and uh, use their language 
just the way that they they best use language. So a little different than the typical child, but they still have it. And I thank you for that encouragement tonight. I think that's that's a very good takeaway. It's there there is potential there. Um, oh, a lot, a and, lot. And Amanda D says thank you for sharing that. Well, um, and thanks for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, we definitely appreciate it. And um, I just want to thank again our sponsor, Bookshark, um, tonight for um, sponsoring this episode. And um, so let's just keep this conversation going, everyone. You can join us in our Facebook support group. Um, and we talk about special education homeschooling all week long. So um, definitely bring your questions there, too. And then next week, we are talking about sign language. We actually have um, three representatives from um, Signing Time that'll be with us, one a sign language interpreter, as well as a homeschool mom that uses um, sign language and teaches it in her local co-op, as well as a signing time rep. And so um, we're going to have just a discussion about how to use sign language to enhance learning and, and help your child to communicate um, better when they have language um, issues. So, so thanks all for joining us. And um, thank you again, Marion, um, for joining us from your travels. And um, we appreciate that. And I hope you all have a great night. And I'll see you again right here next week. Same time. Bye, everybody. Bye.